There I am. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Dr. Steven Sandberg Lewis, and I am really happy to be with you today. I I have done so many webinars and interviews and podcasts and written articles and taught doctors and naturopathic students and medical students of all kinds and been doing this for teaching for 30 years and in practice for 42 years. Actually signed up for Medicare this year, so I've arrived. Uh, but anyway, I I am really happy that uh, that you're interested in this free webinar, and we're calling it "How to Help Your Doctor Treat Your SIBO." I want to. I don't don't usually talk a lot about myself, but I I do want to let you know where I'm coming from, and why we're doing this. Uh, and you can see also that this should be this should be fun. Uh, this may be a lot that you already know if you've been studying like crazy, researching your your condition and or those of someone you love. Uh, but uh, my son, Asher Sandberg Lewis, is an artist and he created the cartoons to go along with this talk. So I hope that makes it more fun. So I do want to take a few minutes to tell you about um, my life's work and why I uh, for the first time, I'm creating my own webinar instead of just being the presenter and someone else putting it together. Uh, so like I said, I've done lots and lots and lots of these things. And in my clinic, which is called Hive Mind Medicine, you know, I talk to one person at a time or if we're, if they come in person to the office and it's not telemedicine, like like everything is right now for, I hope, a very limited uh, period of time. Uh, it's one person and maybe several family members, and that's and that's it, one-on-one, -on -one, basically. Lots of people are coming from a distance or we're doing telemedicine over distance uh, around the country, occasionally outside the country, and we call that an educational consult because I can't really be their doc, one of their doctors when I've never seen them and examined them. I can't prescribe anything that's a prescription for them. I can't even order a medical test for them. But many, many times a week, I'm talking to people in this fashion and I'm sort of coaching them on how to help their doctor make a proper diagnosis, and give them proper treatment for their situation. And I, I don't just work with SIBO, I work with all kinds of digestive issues. I'm especially interested in hiatal hernia, in reflux, in, um, of course, SIBO, inflammatory bowel disease, including microscopic colitis, and all kinds of gallbladder and biliary dyskinesia issues um, where the bile doesn't flow properly. Uh, and then people with just chronic unrelenting nausea and or vomiting that haven't gotten help. Often people with delayed gastric emptying or other motility disorders like you know, gastric, gastroparesis is another name for that. So, those are the things I really enjoy helping people with, as well as uh, you know other problems like fatty livers and things like that that we'll talk about a little bit today. Anyway, so after all these years of doing all these presentations and teaching, I see this as a chance to teach a larger group about some important concepts and give them some details about uh, some of the underpinnings of most functional and uh, most GI disorders. And uh, yeah, I just think it's a, it's a great way to talk to a whole bunch of people all at once, answer some of your questions. We'll try to take as many as we can. 
and um, and help you more efficiently work with your doctor to get what you need. And I, I do want to thank Dr. Allison Seebecker, who I've been collaborating with and meeting with and sharing our what we're learning uh, for the last 12, 13 years, putting all this together. And Siobhan Sana, who uh, does so much good work getting fascinating interviews and information out there, as well as the National University of Natural Medicine, where I teach gastroenterology in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I do have one disclosure about, about um, the fact that I'm on the Speakers Bureau for Salix Pharmaceuticals. Those are the folks that make Rifaximin, Zyfaxan, brand name, and True Lance, which is a constipation medicine. So um, they do pay me to lecture for them, and you should know that. I'm not going to hawk their products, but I think they're very reputable. Anyway, that's uh, that's the intro there. I'm going to go to the first slide here. Which is right here. So this is just some uh, general information uh, about me and Hive Mind Medicine. Uh, that's the phone number. That's the uh, front desk manager, Marks. Uh, the way to get in touch with him through email or through phone. And I have two of my resident physicians. Uh, the last year's uh, resident was Dr. Donovan, and my present resident, Dr. Ahmedpour, who is uh, helping me on this presentation today. This is a picture of the building where we, we have our office downtown Portland. Right now, everything's telemedicine. And uh, Dr. Seebecker and I did help to create the SIBO Center at National University of Natural Medicine about 11 years ago. And um, these are some of the treatments that we use at HiveMind. We, uh, like to call what we do naturopathic gastroenterology or functional gastroenterology. Not just looking at disease, but looking at function and how to regain more ideal function. And we do some lab testing there and we do the Heidelberg capsule test that measures the pH of the stomach especially for our patients with reflux and other heartburn type related problems. We do some body work, which is specific for GI tract health, but also for other things. And we use a lot of neurofeedback and other forms of biofeedback to help retrain the autonomic nervous system to function better and to help heal traumatic brain injury, which can really be a major uh, trigger for GI problems. I'm going to have Dr. Ahmedpour chime in here now and, and talk a little bit about how you can ask questions during this presentation. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Roxanne Ahmedpour, and I'm Dr. Sandberg Lewis's current uh, resident physician, as he mentioned. And I'll be here to help uh, guide the session and moderate the session. And we're hoping this can be interactive. And um, as you have questions, please type them into the chat box uh, on your screen in uh, GoToWebinar in the panel. And I'll be here uh, and you know collecting your questions and reading your questions. And uh, as uh, Dr. Sandberg Lewis is presenting, and it seems particularly um, applicable to the topic, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pause uh, and, and ask Dr. Sandberg-Lewis 
uh, could you address this question that that relates to this topic and we'll you know maybe every 10 15 minutes kind of sprinkle in some questions um, so we can keep this engaging and interactive and uh, we'll try to get to as many questions as, as we can and uh, there will also be some time at the end of the presentation uh, to answer some additional questions that we didn't get to. Um, if you can, please frame your questions um, in a more general sense so we can kind of apply it to a, a broader range of, of folks uh, rather than getting into you know, the, the kind of specifics uh, of your particular medical condition or health history. Uh, and that just helps us kind of answer the question more broadly. Um, and of course, you know, we all have very individual uh, conditions and things, but um, uh, that, that will just help us as we as we go through this presentation. Um, so again, if you have any questions for me, uh, please type them into the chat box and um, I'm looking forward to the rest of the presentation. All right. So what is SIBO? Small intestine bacterial overgrowth really is in many ways, S SIBO is equals IBS, uh, irritable bowel syndrome and SIBO are often the same thing at least 70% of the time. Some studies say up to 87%. And uh, there's a big crossover there. And the typical symptoms, just to kind of lay out the basics, uh, typical symptoms include the abdominal bloating, which sometimes is, of course, the major symptom. The most troubling symptom and until about I would say until about eight or nine years ago when I had a patient who came with bloating as chief complaint chief concern in a way I I thought that's not that's not a real problem I mean that's just bloating and then at some point I ate the wrong thing and I got this food poisoning and I got so bloated. And for two weeks, I felt like I was 90 years old. I had to slow my wife down when we take our walks. And I just felt so tired. And everything was such an effort. And everything was so uncomfortable. And after that, I, I developed a, a very, I think, a very uh, good appreciation for how serious bloating can be and the way that it it affects the nervous system and the function of many systems in the body. Uh, so my son made this picture. I love this picture. It's just <laughs> very funny to me. Another, of course, typical symptom is abdominal discomfort or worse pain. And uh, certainly everybody can relate to this as being related to bloating, because when you distend small intestine or large intestine with gas, made in this case by bacteria or archaea, uh, that can really trigger many nerve endings that stimulate pain. And uh, some, of the, some of the worst pain that gets people going to the emergency room can be related to this kind of distension. And then, of course, there's the change in stool frequency or the consistency of the stool and um, how much difficulty there might be either keeping it from coming out when you don't want it to or getting it to come out when you feel the urge. So large volumes of hydrogen gas tend to cause diarrhea and methane gas tends to cause constipation. Unfortunately, even in lower amounts, such as three parts per million or more on a breath test, but uh, even higher levels uh, cause all kinds of slowing down and stagnation of motility. And if you've looked into SIBO at all, you know there are 
many associated health conditions, including fibromyalgia, which some studies show that the higher the hydrogen level being produced by bacteria in the gut, the more muscle pain there is. We're going to talk about thyroid problems a little more, skin problems like rosacea or adult acne, interstitial cystitis. There's been research, several research studies on that and its relationship, uh, and, and restless leg syndrome. Certainly, many, many liver conditions, whether it's non alcoholic fatty liver disease related to prediabetes and metabolic syndrome and diabetes, whether it's uh, more advanced cirrhosis of the liver, whether it's due to any cause, it could be alcoholic cirrhosis, it could be due to autoimmune disease, it could be due to fatty liver, uh, very much associated with with SIBO and, you know, if you were to just Google rifaximin and liver, um, you would probably get to a, a site that Salix created that talks about hepatic encephalopathy, which is a central nervous system problem caused by liver disease, cirrhosis. And uh, they, they use rifaximin uh, for that, and studies have shown it to be effective to help clear up the central nervous system brain conditions. So there are a lot of connections with liver disease, lots of connections. And over on the right, Crohn's disease, the type of inflammatory bowel disease, and certainly mast cell activation syndromes related to allergy and histamine levels being too high. Lots of gallbladder problems, which I like to treat. Um, and then all the reflux, including reflux esophagitis, people who have uh, erosive esophagitis, that is very much associated with SIBO. There are other causes as well, but that's a big one. Celiac disease almost always uh, leads to bacterial overgrowth due to carbohydrate malabsorption. And pancreatic insufficiency is a big issue when the pancreas doesn't make enough of its enzymes. This is my working chart for the underlying causes, the things that cause SIBO. And there are others, and I keep adding more, but I, I try to not add too many because it's going to get crazy. But this just gives you an idea of how much complexity can be behind SIBO. And this this is one of the things that should remind us that just diagnosing bacterial overgrowth, treating it in whichever way it's treated, and we'll talk about some treatments today, and, um, and calling it good is not that successful. Now, for some people, it's very successful. They, we call that one and done. One treatment, they're done. But usually, the kind of cases I see, there's there's more behind it, and any of these things and combinations of these things could be behind the small intestine bacterial overgrowth that everything's pointing to at the bottom. So, unless these underlying causes are addressed, if they can be, not all of them are fully treatable, it just depends, then recurrences of SIBO are common. So, we're going to talk about some of these causes today and much more detail when we do our follow-up series of six webinars for those that want to go into it more deeply. So yeah, this is a very complex problem. And what I wanna do, like I said, is give you an overview of how to help your healthcare practitioner go through this process with you to, to really get the best diagnosis and treatment and outcome that you can. So starting out with testing. Can I pause you, Dr. Sandberg-Lewis, for a question? Yeah. So a uh, great question. How can you differentiate between SIBO and IBS? And is it necessary 
to differentiate or you can or can you treat both conditions the same way all right well so you know if we go back to this and say that in the study that showed the highest correlation, 87% uh, of people with irritable bowel syndrome have SIBO. Uh, it's, we estimate that, they say that uh, depending on the population, somewhere between 10 and 20% of the population has irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, that's why it's been studied so much because it's so incredibly common. And if we just were to say, let's say two thirds of those people, have irritable bowel syndrome because of SIBO, that would mean we might have about, uh, someone's estimated somewhere between 20 and 30 million people just in the United States that have SIBO. Because um, that's not the entire 10 to 20% of the population that has IBS. And, uh, you can do the math yourself if you're a mathematician, but it, it gives you an idea of, of how many people are affected. And so, you know, if we used 87% as the crossover, we've got 13% of people with irritable bowel syndrome that don't have SIBO. And certainly I've seen those cases. And in those cases, I do a lecture on irritable bowel syndrome aside from SIBO. Uh, in the gastroenterology, gastroenterology course that, that we teach at NUNM, the university. And so I try to lay out the fact that I think those 13% of cases, 13 to 20% of cases that are not due to SIBO are due to small or large intestine fungal overgrowth, yeast overgrowth, or they're they're due to, if it's a diarrhea type especially, they're due to a parasite that hasn't been found. And when you treat that, the IBS goes away. Or it's due to slow down motility due to a previous food poisoning that hasn't quite led to a bacterial overgrowth yet, but things have slowed down and symptoms develop. Or it's someone who has a motility disorder such as gastroparesis so that their stomach doesn't empty properly. It always feels full and they're, they're gonna have lots of symptoms based on that. Or it could be that they don't make enough digestive enzymes, especially pancreatic insufficiency, which we find a lot and get very, very good results treating irritable bowel syndrome and other problems by, by normalizing that. So just an example of some of the things, some examples of some of the things that can cause the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome that, um, that are not related to bacterial overgrowth necessarily. Testing. It's funny because I was just talking to a physician on the phone the other day and uh, he used the term breathalyzer <laughs> when he was asking about the breath testing. And uh, my son, I guess, thought of the same thing and, and made this cartoon. But yeah, breath testing can breath testing can, can be used to test for a number of things. It can be used to be uh, to test people for H. pylori. That's the H. pylori breath test. It can be used to check for malabsorption problems with certain simple sugars, uh, such as sucrose malabsorption or fructose malabsorption and uh, lactose intolerance. And then it can be used to test for bacterial overgrowth in the small bowel. So if the symptoms fit, and we, we talked about the basic ones, bloating, constipation or diarrhea or going between the two and abdominal pain or discomfort, uh, if those symptoms fit, then you get, get a breath test. 
or some other appropriate test. So what are they? There's three basic tests that are used. There's the glucose breath test, which uses glucose, simplest of all sugars, uh, to uh, you drink a solution of, of glucose and then your uh, breath is sampled every 20 minutes for three hours. And we see if that sugar leads to feeding of bacteria and production of hydrogen and or methane, bacteria and archaea. And we see how high the levels are. The next one is the duodenal aspirate. This would be a culture of fluid from the upper small intestine, the duodenum, that's taken during an upper endoscopy scope exam. And the thing is, these first two methods of testing only test the first few inches, perhaps up to a foot or so, of small intestine. If there's bacterial overgrowth in that very upper part of the small intestine, it could be measured. If it's lower down, it will not show up and the test will uh, not show SIBO, even though it may be there. So, you know, we told my son, the small intestine is really about 18 to 20 feet long on most people. And so if you're really looking at the first two feet or less and looking for overgrowth there, you're missing up to 18 feet of small intestine where the bacterial overgrowth could also be occurring. And, uh, and we see that a lot. We see levels uh, of gases not going up on a lot of patients until 90 or 100 minutes or even 120 minutes, which is our cutoff for looking at hydrogen. So uh, it's, it can be really deceiving to just use glucose. Now, lactulose is a kind of a synthetic sugar. It was designed to not be absorbed. Humans cannot absorb it. So it just goes through the GI tract all the way through, all the way through all parts of the small intestine and the large intestine, and comes out in the toilet. But bacteria and archaea that make methane, they can break it down. They, they can do lots of things that we can't do. And so it will test for levels of bacterial overgrowth for the entire small intestine and even the large intestine. We, we don't really concern ourselves too much with the last three samples in the last hour of the test because those are, are more related to the large intestine. And we, ex we expect there to be very high numbers, millions of bacteria and archaea per gram of uh, stool in the large intestine. But we're looking for elevations higher up in the small intestine if they're present. So that's why we, we hardly ever use a glucose breath test at our office. We do the lactulose breath test. Now, most doctors have never ordered a breath test or a duodenal aspirate. And as my, my son wrote here, I guess diagnosing SIVO just isn't very me. Um, I'm not making fun of doctors. They, you know, doctors are smart. They have a lot of information. There's a lot of juggling. It's a very complex thing to be doing. To really understand SIBO, its testing and its interpretation and its treatment and management, it, it's, it's like a whole world in itself. And if you've looked into it, you realize there's a lot to it. But um, if you rely on your doctor to come up with a suggestion to do a breath test, it's unlikely that that will occur for maybe 98% of doctors. You'll have to bring it up. And there are different types of SIBO. There's not just one type. Um, at the top here, you see the Quintron breath tracker, which is the machine that most all labs use. It's, the, it's been around since the 1960s and 70s. 
And uh, below that, you see somebody taking a sample by breathing into that device, which would be an in-house test done at a lab or an office, uh, rather than the one that uses the tubes that are shown above, the test tubes, uh, which that testing can be done at home and mailed in. So there's hydrogen dominant SIBO. Sometimes all you see is the elevation of hydrogen. And those levels can be quite high when they are at the most severe. It can be a combination of hydrogen and methane. It can be just methane. And nowadays, if there's no elevation of hydrogen, we call that intestinal methanogen overgrowth, which makes sense because, you know, SIBO has the B in it for bacteria. And the organisms that make methane really aren't bacteria. They're, they're similar, called archaea, but they're not bacteria. So it's good that we changed it to intestinal methanogen overgrowth when it's only methane that's there. And uh, then, of course, there's the infamous hydrogen sulfide SIBO. The only reason it's infamous that I use that term is because it has to be deduced by an absence of the other gases. Because the, the bacteria that make hydrogen sulfide produce it from hydrogen, they steal all the hydrogen, so to speak, so that the methane producers can't make methane and the hydrogen will look very low. We call that a flat line test. And it'll look flat even in the large intestine where you expect to see millions of hydrogen producers and it'll just look like there's nothing there. And that's because it's all getting converted to hydrogen sulfide, which currently we can't measure. And so it looks like nothing. And they're all different different types there's you know there's methane where it's high right at the baseline and stays high the entire test and we have certain connections that we see with that with other conditions it may start out nice and low at zero one or two and and rise during the test after drinking lactulose lots of different patterns that we see that we consider as important and then of course as we mentioned with irritable bowel syndrome that isn't caused by SIBO, you can also have intestinal yeast or fungal overgrowth either by itself or on top of the SIBO. And there can be parasites, Giardia, Cryptosporidium, Blastocystis hominis, Dientamoeba fragilis, there's a whole host, Entamoeba histolytica. And these can be tested, the yeast and the parasites, with a stool test. But remember, a stool test doesn't show us about small intestine bacterial overgrowth. The sample of stool is really giving us information about what's growing in the large intestine, which we want to know. So stool can be either cultured, grown out in a culture, or machines that measure the DNA for different organisms can be tested in the large intestine There's the, uh, from the stool. And um, yeast can be cultured as well and can be looked at under the microscope. There are also, for parasites, um, sometimes you just see the eggs instead of the more developed worms or other parasites. Or uh, we can measure chemicals that these bugs leave behind even if we can't see them in the stool things that we call stool antigens. And those are, uh, for instance, available for things like Giardia and Cryptosporidium. And there are tests also for toxins like Clostridium difficile. So these are all things that can be tested in the stool. Often we'll also do a panel that will give us additional information that's important for underlying causes of SIBO and causes of irritable bowel syndrome, such as um, 
elastase or chymotrypsin levels in the stool, which tell us about pancreatic enzyme levels. We get uh, information about the health of the lining of the digestive tract, mucous membrane. We take measurements of certain immune factors that can either tell us about inflammation going on in the gut, which we want to know about if it's present, or uh, just tell us about the health of the immune system in the gut, which is one of the biggest parts of the immune system in the whole body. And then sometimes we also get markers of permeability, such as zonulin, uh, which is a marker for leaky gut or intestinal hyperpermeability. It's good to note also that you can have excessive perme permeability anywhere in the GI tract. There's special kinds of leaky gut, so to speak, for the esophagus, for the stomach, for the small intestine and the large intestine. And a big issue is post-infectious IBS. Dr. Pimentel and his research group really feel that post-infectious IBS really is the same thing as SIBO, meaning that often, about 10% of the time we think, someone gets traveler's diarrhea or what's called gastroenteritis or food poisoning, different names for the same thing, uh, often the immune system of the, of the person's body will produce antibodies, antibodies against certain factors such as cytolethal distending toxin and vinculin, and we'll see those on the next slide. And uh, that can lead to chronic irritable bowel syndrome and bacterial overgrowth because of its effects on the motility, the muscle activity of the small intestine. So there are about three labs I'm aware of that do this kind of testing for antibodies. The initial test that was worked out at Cedar sinai uh, Medical Center in California is the IBS SMART test. And it, as I said, it measures antibodies to vinculin and cytolethal distending toxin or CDTB for short. And, and these are antibodies you can measure in the blood that are produced by the immune system in response to a food poisoning. That food poisoning may have been years ago and these antibody levels still can persist at high levels for at least three to five years. And in some people we see high levels even later. The problem, as I said, is that high levels of these antibodies not only react with the initial, for instance, toxin, CDTB, that was produced by the bug that's gone. Years later, those antibodies can still be there. And those antibodies, unfortunately, also affect the motility, the muscular contraction, the migrating motor complex in the small intestine by attacking those pacemaker nerve cells that control that muscular activity. So if we were to say, what are the three basic tests for most people that have IBS and might have SIBO, we would want a three hour lactulose breath test with proper prep and handling. We'd want a comprehensive stool test that would tell us about that the bacteria in the large intestine, yeast cultures, checking for dangerous organisms like Clostridium difficile, if there's diarrhea as part of the big part of the problem, um, checking for some parasites, and a checking for mucosal health markers that are checked on these tests, as well as pancreatic enzymes. 
and then um, an IBS smart or similar blood test to check for antibodies that may develop after food poisoning. Lots of other tests may be needed depending on the case. Again, we'll get into the details of all this. If you're interested in going further, uh, we'll have a sign up for a six week webinar. At the end of this, we'll give you more information about that. But we talk about things like various hormone tests, and that's especially true for thyroid and adrenal function. Um, testing for other autoimmune diseases, because autoimmune diseases can be very much linked with SIBO. It depends on the case. We might do uh, bait and score and other types of tests and evaluations for hypermobility syndromes that are very much associated with SIBO and IBS type symptoms. We might check the person's stomach acid production, whether it's too high, just right, or too low. And we know that underproduction of stomach acid is a big risk factor for bacterial overgrowth in the stomach as well as in the small intestine. We might sometimes use imaging tests, depending on what other conditions are going on, and to check for motility. Um, or to check for other diseases like Crohn's disease or anatomical abnormalities or diverticuli and all kinds of other things that might be present that could lead to overgrowth of bacteria. So we might use a CAT scan, MRI, a barium x-ray, barium swallow, barium enema. We don't use that often anymore, but barium swallow and small bowel follow through. There are, of course, abdominal and pelvic ultrasounds. There's the HIDA scan, which measures motility of the gallbladder and the functionality of the whole biliary tree that comes down from the liver to the small intestine and gallbladder. We often use gastric emptying studies to see if the stomach is emptying properly or staying full for too long. The SMART pill test is another way to check gastric emptying as well as the amount of time that food and bacteria spend in the small intestine and large intestine. And then of course, endoscopy to get direct biopsy information about different tissues in the upper GI tract or colonoscopy for the lower. And then additional blood tests, we might use antibodies for celiac disease, especially in people that still are consuming gluten uh, so that we get a, a adequate antibody level if it's present. We might often do a complete blood count to see how the immune system is reacting to infections or inflammation and to check for anemias, which can be a common uh, after effect from bacterial overgrowth since the bacteria like to eat iron and steal B12 from the digestive tract. We might uh, do methylmalonic acid tests on the urine or blood to check for B12 levels. Various tests that we use for folic acid levels and SNPs, um, mutations of folic acid function. Uh, often do a ferritin test to check for iron levels. Again, bacteria really like to take the, the iron for their own use. When they're overgrown, they can take more. We'll check blood sugar levels, long-term blood sugar levels through a hemoglobin A1c, and often we'll do a fasting insulin, sometimes fasting and after a meal as well to check for diabetes and prediabetes and tendencies for insulin to become very high and other cases low. And then um, antibody tests for other chronic infections, whether they're viral or bacterial. I mentioned the hormone testing, especially for thyroid and for the adrenals and the other 
reproductive steroid hormones, which are very, very much involved with uh, a balancing effect on the thyroid. And the thyroid has so much effect on motility through the gut. We have any more uh, questions, Dr. Ahmedpour, before I move on to treatment options? Yeah. So, you know, a big question that's come up is how do you go about finding a doctor locally who is familiar with these kinds of tests? And if they're not familiar with these kinds of tests, how do you go about um, you know, proposing it to your doctor and, and getting them to order it for you. Yeah, excellent. And, and we deal with this all the time because like I said, we're, we're kind of helping doing these educational consults, trying to get people what they need in different parts of the country. Um, for some reason, you know, I have smatterings of, of people that I consult with through the, the middle part of the country. Um, most states, there's at least one or two or three, but more of them in Florida, West Virginia, Virginia, New York, New Jersey, um, California, all the way up to Canada and Seattle and upper um, Washington areas. Yeah, and then like yesterday, I think I had three consults just from California. So people all over the country, some places they have functional medicine doctors that are osteopaths or medical doctors or nurse practitioners that um, are familiar with a lot of these tests and very willing to help you uh, by ordering them and um, working with me or whoever else is coaching if they need coaching. And um, I would say 80% of my patients, 80% uh, of my educational consults that I do around the country, people will have that kind of a healthcare practitioner to work with. And, and I'll tell you just the, the truth is that if the doctor doesn't have this kind of expertise and a patient keeps coming back with all these problems the doctor just doesn't know what to do they feel kind of helpless it's not that they don't want the person to come back but all, they almost want you know don't look forward to having to see them again because or talk to them again because they have no clue what's going on they've come to the end of their diagnostic rope and they don't have any idea so usually it's very welcome Unless the doctor's a little bit more on the egotistical side and, you know, my way or the highway, and they just don't want anybody else's advice, I think many doctors uh, welcome this kind of support and um, are willing to be coached, so to speak, by, the, by you, uh, if you're the patient, or by uh, other experts around the country who might give some guidance about where to start and how to proceed. So I would say, yeah, nurse practitioners, uh, functional medicine doctors, whether they're osteopathic or medical doctors, and sometimes they're also chiropractic physicians. It just depends on the state whether they do lab testing and what they can, what their uh, license allows. I'll also add that I'll be sharing a, a link to the gastro a and site, um, which is the Gastroenterology Association of Naturopathic Physicians. It's an organization where naturopathic doctors who have uh, specialized training in naturopathic gastroenterology uh, register and they can um, include their practice information and location. So there's a provider directory and I'll share that all with you and hopefully there's a, a gastro A&P doctor in your area 
and most of the doctors, um, most of the naturopathic physicians on the gastro a &P are trained by Dr. Sandberg Lewis. He's, he's um, you know, been teaching for, for decades and uh, a lot of us are trained by Dr. Sandberg Lewis and have the same sort of uh, approach and uh, knowledge base. So that's a good resource. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, and I've had a resident physician working with me for a year at a time for the last four years. And um, and those are some of the superstars of the gastro a &P, but there are, there are, yeah, it's a terrific organization and you can get names of people throughout the country. So this is a colorful diagram that uh, is our updated version of our treatment protocol. Dr. Seebacker and I came up with, uh, we kind of first saw a, a similar protocol like this that was uh, created by Dr. Pimentel. And we thought, hey, we should add some of the things that we do and we found very effective and make this a little bit more thorough from our standpoint. And so um, this just shows that when SIBO is suspected and you do a test and it's positive at the top. Uh, you go to the purple area where you have three basic options for treatment, whether that's uh, prescription antibiotics, elemental diet, or herbal antibiotics, and then diet. And you know, Dr. Pimentel, he, he is a researcher and he really does not want people to change their diet while they're in this treatment phase, this purple phase here, um, because he wants to see how his treatment is working. And, and that makes sense for a researcher, but we have found so much benefit uh, of using diet during treatment as well as, as prevention afterwards that we, we include that as uh, part of it, part of treatment. And then immediately you can see everything goes down to prokinetic in the middle in purple because we always, virtually always follow the treatment with prokinetic and diet to help prevent recurrence. And then we reassess usually one to two weeks after the, they've started the prokinetic and, and prokinetics of course can be herbal natural products or prescription. And then uh, over on the left in green, if they feel 80 to 90% better in terms of their major uh, SIBO symptoms, we go into the prevention phase below that with diet and continuing prokinetic and using meal spacing to allow the migrating motor complex to be more effective along with the prokinetic. And you can see there it says diet, prokinetic, and meal spacing three months to ongoing because people who have those elevated antibodies in the blood, they may need a prokinetic for years, like a minimum of three to five years. Whereas other people that don't have that might just use it for several months and then uh, not have to continue. Then there's a uh, Below that in red, the possibility of relapse. And then that takes us over to investigate underlying cause. If the underlying cause hasn't really been looked at. And I see a lot of people at this phase. They've already had a test. They've already gotten standard prescription antibiotic treatment. Maybe they've had a prokinetic or maybe not. They've felt dramatically better for a short time and then they relapsed. And then they come, you know, talk to me about why, why is this coming back? I was feeling so great. And so there we start to look at the underlying causes and, and address any ones that we can. The other option, of course, the other path that things may take starting again at the prokinetic in the middle after, after any of those purple treatments the person might just have partial improvement. Maybe they're 30% better, or they just don't really feel much different at all. That's when we're going to do another breath test shown there in yellow. 
on the right, usually within two weeks, because we want to we don't want to wait too long. We want to see what what changed. And if the test is still positive, we're going to do it some other treatment or continued treatment. Sometimes the gas levels are so high, it's just going to take a series of courses to bring it down. Or if the test comes back negative, shown in green there on the right, we're going to consider other causes of their symptoms. And there are, as, you, as we talked about, many other causes besides bacterial overgrowth for some of these same symptoms. So let's outline basic treatments, herbal antimicrobials. Uh, there's some that we find more effective for hydrogen type SIBO listed at the top. Um, many different herbs that contain the compound berberine, things like golden seal, Oregon grape, uh, golden thread, uh, philodendron. There are a number of different um, herbs that contain that. And then there are products. These are listed by brand name below. These are products that were studied in the Johns Hopkins study where they compared herbal treatment to antibiotic prescription treatment for SIBO. That study, which was done four or five years ago, written up four or five years ago, it, it only looked at hydrogen SIBO. So I list those there. They could possibly be helpful for methane type and mix type, but um, not perhaps as reliable. And then uh, on, on the bottom, the methane focused treatments, the extract of garlic, the that pure allicin, uh, which doesn't have the fructans, the fermentable carbohydrates that garlic has, but it just has the antibiotic and antifungal, anti-yeast uh, activity. There's oregano oil, which can also be very helpful for hydrogen overgrowth. And of course, Autrantil, which is a brand name product um, that a gastroenterologist in Texas came up with uh, that is a, a different herbal focus for methane. And of course, as you might have guessed from what I said about garlic, the nice thing about all of these herbs is that they have antifungal, anti-yeast activity as well. So I can't say that I've ever seen a case where someone was treated with herbal antimicrobials like this and developed a yeast overgrowth or it triggered uh, yeast overgrowth because it's usually um, controlled as well by uh, the herbs. Whereas the next group, prescription antibiotics, do have that risk of um, leading to a yeast overgrowth. And the uh, elemental diet does as well, has that risk. So hydrogen-focused treatment, rifaximin is kind of the, the big name uh, generic for treating hydrogen SIBO. Zyfaxan is the brand name uh, in the United States, Salix brand name. There are different brand names in different countries of rifaximin. And then there's the methane-focused treatment, which would be rifaximin again but unless there's a second antibiotic added to it, either neomycin most commonly or metronidazole, which is also called Flagyl as a brand name, uh, unless that second antibiotic is added, methane is not likely to be adequately treated. And that, this is another place where I see a lot of people, they've, they've been to a doctor, they've ask their doctor to do a breath test sometimes three or four times, eventually they do it. And then doctor says, huh, you've got, a, you've got a positive breath test. The treatment for that is rifaximin. That's what most doctors know. Um, they, don't, they don't have the time and energy and focus to um, study beyond that. And so they're just gonna give rifaximin, which may, not be very effective 
for treating methane. And then there's the elemental diet, which is a, a drink that replaces food. And it could be the homemade elemental diet that Dr. Seebecker has recipes for at her website. It could be a Nestle's product. They make several of them. We're not crazy about their ingredients, but it does work and it was studied for, especially for hydrogen SIBO. And, and then there are some more natural um, products such as Physician's Elemental Diet. And I think Michael, Dr. Michael Ruscio also has uh, elemental and semi-elemental diets as well. So it requires no digestion. It has all the nutrients that a person needs to live, protein, carbohydrate, fat, vitamins, minerals, but it goes right in. It's almost like having intravenous nutrition, but it goes through the, through the gut wall. It's already fully digested. They're simple forms. And because of that, it gets absorbed, they believe, within the first one or two feet of the small intestine, and therefore doesn't provide food for the areas where the bacteria are overgrowing. So it's especially good for what we call distal SIBO or bacterial overgrowth or methanogen overgrowth that is further down in the small intestine, the kind that isn't adequately tested with a glucose breath test, but shows up on a lactulose breath test. Elemental diet is especially useful when bacterial overgrowth is severe. We use the term severe when the gas levels are above 100 parts per million, and anything over 15 parts per million is considered SIBO uh, when you combine the, the total gases when they're at their highest. So 100, five times that, and certainly we see levels even higher than 100, approaching 150 and, and above. So um, that's severe. And those are situations where using an elemental diet can dramatically reduce the levels of bacteria or methanogens within two to three weeks. It's not easy to do, and if a person's never been on a fast or a liquid diet, it can be challenging for sure. Not an easy thing, but it's a, it's a good treatment when other things have failed to work for you, and um, if you have the right personality and focus and desire to, to do this. We generally don't recommend elemental diets for people that have had a history of eating disorders, just because we don't want to kick up more problems with, with eating behavior, but um, it's used for many other conditions. And in, including childhood Crohn's disease, it's, it's sometimes, elemental diet is sometimes the most effective thing you can do. We have any question that I should address before I move on to prevention? Um, I think so far, so good. We do have a lot of questions about prevention. So um, yeah, we can, we can go ahead and move forward there. Great. All right. So we'll talk about prokinetics and diet. And, um, you know, I didn't, under prokinetics here, under uh, prescription, I left, no, I got it on there, good. Okay, over on the left, we have the herbal, and they're not necessarily made from pumpkins, but that's the picture that I found. There's Iberogas, which is a German combination liquid tincture. Uh, nine or 10 herbs that have a number of beneficial functions in the gut, helping to reduce gas, to relax muscle cramps, uh, but also uh, Iberis amara, the lead herb in, the, in that tincture, uh, is a prokinetic and has uh, similar, similar kinds of activities to serotonin receptor modulators 
in the prescription side and uh, has been studied extensively. German uh, herbalists and doctors tend to really study the heck out of their, their herbal products. And uh, it's a good one. It's, it's a liquid, so it also can be done in drop doses. It can you know, be used for children at eight drops before each meal in a little water or for adults with 20 drops. And I'm not prescribing anything here, but that's the typical dosage. Um, some doctors use it the whole day's dosage at bedtime to help focus more on the migrating motor complex during fasting at night. So they might give the entire dose just all at once at bedtime. And we often do that. There's ginger. Ginger is an amazing herb. Everyone knows that it's especially good for nausea, but it is a prokinetic, and that's why it can help. One of the reasons why it can help with nausea. Uh, it does modulate serotonin receptors, like some of the prescription medicines. And I think of ginger especially being helpful for the upper GI tract, the stomach, and the small intestine. It, it may have some activities in the large intestine as well, but I really, I think of it as more upper GI, uh, which is good for trying to prevent recurrence of SIBO. So you might think of ginger as especially useful for someone who has SIBO, we're trying to prevent recurrence, and one of their problems tends to be nausea, but it can be used even without nausea. There's Motility Activator, that's an actual brand name uh, of a product. It's a combination of ginger, sort of lower burning type of ginger, has less ginger all in it, which can be the, the type that's spicy and burning, but uh, also has artichoke extract in it, which helps with bile flow and movement through this whole, the whole liver, gallbladder, bile system, uh, which also helps to improve motility through the upper small intestine. And we use that a lot. And then there's Modal Pro, which is a, a product that one of the companies put together, another brand name, that um, incorporates sort of all the natural substances that have been found to improve motility in the upper, but also in the lower uh, gut. So in the colon, it's gonna help with constipation. And those are things like precursors to serotonin, 5-HTP, which is a tryptophan uh, metabolite, which is a precursor to serotonin production in the body, as, as well as activated B6, uh, which helps to, to convert that precursor into serotonin and also has some uh, factors that help um, such as acetyl L-carnitine which help to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system that controls motility in the gut and ginger. I think ginger is the main component in there because it really is an excellent one. So a lot of ginger over there on the left over on the right, we have prescription prokinetics, low dose erythromycin. We call it that. It's erythromycin, as you may recall, it's something that was used as a antibiotic back when I was a kid. Um, nowadays, there's a, a new synthetic called zithromycin that's used instead. Hardly anybody uses erythromycin anymore. But uh, in low doses, about a fifth of the potency of what used to be used three times a day for um, an antibiotic, 50 milligram or, or so erythromycin once a day can be used as a prokinetic at bedtime, and doctors can prescribe that if it's appropriate. Low-dose naltrexone is a medicine, another low-dose. Uh, can be given any time of day, but it, we especially tend to use this when there's autoimmune disease associated with the SIBO, and when I personally tend to use it when 
my patients have those antibodies that are measured on the IBS SMART test, those antibodies that may be produced in about 10% of people after they've had food poisoning. The naltrexone helps to lower those, we think, lower those autoantibody levels. Um, that hasn't directly been studied, but it does help with autoimmune disease, and that's been studied very extensively. And then there's procalipride, which is the generic name for what in the United States is called Motegrity, and in Canada is called Resilor or Resitran. Procalipride is a serotonin receptor modulator, so it, it's especially good for our patients that have long-term constipation. Uh, it can really help to produce a bowel movement, have a laxative effect, but also is uh, prokinetic for the upper digestive tract as well, so it helps with prevention of recurrence for SIBO. And then, of course, many diets, many diets, in fact, there are two more that aren't listed here. One would be the GAPS diet, gut and psychology syndrome, GAPS diet, or the specific carbohydrate diet, which uh, initially was designed to treat celiac disease and inflammatory bowel disease. We still use it for those, but uh, Dr. Seebecker has modified it and created the SIBO specific food guide listed there on the, the second one. Uh, you can read all about that at her website listed there. The uh, this SIBO specific food guide is actually a combination of the specific carbohydrate diet that's not listed here and the FODMAPS diet that's listed above. Dr. Seebecker put those two together because each one had very effective results for SIBO. And she thought, well, why not just combine them so they're all in one chart? And uh, we've been using that for about nine or 10 years with good results. One thing to know about some of these diets are really not conducive to use in patients who are vegans or vegetarians, strict vegetarians. So if someone is a vegan or strict vegeta vegetarian, I recommend they either use just the plain FODMAPS diet listed there from Monash University, or there is a biphasic diet that Dr. Nirala Jacobi in Australia came up with based on Dr. Seebecker's food guide and she modified it to have two phases, an introductory phase during treatment and then reintroduction of foods in the second phase. And she's created a vegetarian and vegan version and also has a version that's a low histamine version. So she's just kind of expanded that into other areas. The cedar sinai low fermentation diet that Dr. Pimentel and his group came up with, I consider that one as the most liberal of all these diets. And almost anybody can use that. Uh, he wanted to create a diet that someone who was traveling anywhere in the United States or even around the world could find something to eat uh, easily. And so it just has. Uh, a limited number of restrictions and guidelines and is certainly appropriate for vegan, vegetarian, or uh, omnivores. And then there's, there's the fast track diet, which was especially designed to help with the type of bacterial overgrowth and fermentation that leads to heartburn and reflux. And, uh, that's one of those diet that, diets that has uh, a numbering system for different foods. Some people find that useful to have a chart with, with a number. Um, there, are, there are apps for the phone for Dr. Seebecker's SIBO specific food guide as well and the, and the FODMAPS diet alone. So there are, there are apps for, for a number of these. 
And by the way, almost all of these diets, there's good information and links from Dr. Seebecker's website, SIBO Info. So Dr. Sandberg Lewis, just to um, keep us keep us on track, we have about six minutes left uh, of the webinar, and um, we're trying to get to as many questions as possible. But but just wanting to to do a time check and and letting you all know that we'll we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. Yeah, and if you can, if you have time to be on for another half hour, we will take as many questions as we answer as many questions as we can um, i just put a slide in here at the end to show you the kinds of topics that i am going to discuss in the six week webinar series if you are interested in that or you know someone who's interested um, these are the some of the details that we'll go into some of the things we talked about today but more specifics details how to uh, ask your doctor for the right tests and the important pieces to understand as underlying causes. Go through each of those underlying causes, talk about what can be done about them and the ones that can't be dealt with. Many, many treatments are available that can help with the underlying cause. And then more, more details about treatments, some of the treatments that are less common that, that I didn't talk about today, physical treatments, uh, hot and cold water based treatments, treatments that focus on the vagus nerve function and how important stress management is and how we use that and how it all relates to the liver and how problems with the liver lead to problems with SIBO and then more about prevention. So here we are. Great. Um, so we have uh, a number of questions and I'll, I'll just start throwing some out there. Um, so what do you recommend if the elemental diet is causing loose stools or diarrhea? I've had a number of people who have had that reaction, and I've had some people who welcomed it because they were chronically constipated, and it only occurred for three or four days or up to a week, gradually decreasing in severity. And then, and then they found that it just worked its way out. Um, so in, in that way, you might think of it as um, sort of cleaning some, some things out that needed to occur. I, I don't see that commonly. More commonly, people may actually go for several days without much coming out at all because there's no fiber, and fiber is a big part of what makes up the stool volume besides the bulk of dead bacteria. and sloughed off cells from the lining of the intestine. So um, often there won't be much at all. If, if there is a reaction, one thing a person could do is they could dilute the elemental diet powder more than they have been, so it's not as concentrated, uh, and they wouldn't have as much perhaps uh, osmolar effect in the small intestine of very concentrated nutrients um, being in the small intestine before they, they get absorbed. And uh, it's also possible that they just might not tolerate that particular formula, and there are different elemental diet formulas. Um, I think one of the biggest things we, we encounter with elemental diet is getting people to drink enough of it, because it's kind of like a job to have to sip it all day. You can't just chug it. That's another thing that could cause diarrhea would be drinking it too fast. So using a straw to slow down the amount that you take at a time and taking 10 minute breaks uh, in between taking a few sips throughout the day. Uh, it, like I say, it's like a job because you, you have to kind of take a, sh a shaker jar and shake it up and 
drink a couple of sips and then take a break for 10 minutes or so. Um, I think those might be some of the most common reasons. Yeah. Um, so could you speak on uh, fermented foods and the topic of prebiotics and probiotics with SIBO? I wrote an article, uh, a blog on my um, on my website, Functional Gastroenterology, and it's also in the Townsend letter previously published. And it was on the common misconception, uh, common mistaking of highly fermentable foods and fermented food. And there is no there's no restriction on using fermented foods meaning things that are fermented in a jar or a crock or uh, previous to ingesting them so sauerkraut pickles uh, capers olives uh, anything that's that's fermented uh, dr Seebecker did find some some issues with certain brands of kombucha and uh, doesn't recommend it early on in treatment. But um, fermented foods such as 24-hour yogurt, 24-hour kefir, um, hard cheeses, things that are fermented, uh, there's, there's not really a restriction unless the person has a specific reaction that's negative. And remember that when foods are fermented, before you eat them, they're made as fermented foods like sauerkraut. The gases that are produced by the bacteria and the yeasts when the fermentation is taking place, they go off into the atmosphere and they don't go into your body. So when you eat them, they are already pre-fermented and you get all the benefits of lactic acid, bacteria and other fermentative, fermentative products without getting the gas. And so it's a very different thing than eating highly fermentable foods, which is what all these diets are designed to reduce, um, reduce the amount of fermentable carbohydrates. Because if you ferment a food in your small intestine or large intestine, it's gonna produce gas. And in this case, we're trying to limit that and uh, not give the bacteria a lot of carbohydrate in which to ferment i hope that answers yeah, the question that question it's a big topic it's a big topic um and you know particularly probiotic supplements it's a common question that we get from our patients um do you know do we recommend taking probiotic supplements with sibo and what if someone takes a probiotic supplement and they feel worse on it yeah, when Dr. Elaine Gottschall, actually she wasn't, she was, had a master's degree. When, when Elaine Gottschall um, wrote her, her book, Breaking the Vicious Cycle, which introduced this topic to a lot of people, SIBO, she said that lactobacillus was fine, but bifidobacter probiotics should not be used. And when the GAPS diet and the GAPS book got written, uh, the physician that wrote that book, she highly suggested fermented foods of all kinds, many kinds, as well as um, bifidobacter-based probiotics. So there's been kind of an evolution of that. I think it makes perfect sense that people can react to probiotics, number one, because many of them have prebiotics in them. Prebiotics are short chain or what we call oligosaccharide type carbohydrates that are actually a type of fiber that feeds the bacteria. So it makes sense to put food in there with the bacteria, uh, you know, if you're giving a probiotic, but unfortunately, that will also feed the overgrown bacteria in SIBO, and many people will get more gas and bloating and symptoms. 
from that. So we certainly, if we're going to recommend a probiotic, we recommend the ones that don't have prebiotics, such as fructooligosaccharides in them. And that being said, I mean, lactobacillus itself is one of the uh, genus of bacteria, gen genera of bacteria that can cause SIBO. The, the lactobacillus can be overgrown, and certainly it can be overgrown in the vagina in women. That's called cytolytic vaginitis, and it can be overgrown in the small intestine, uh, which we call SIBO. There are other bacteria, that, many others that can that can overgrow, but that's one of them. So I, I suspect that especially if you put in a nice uh, 10 billion or 20 billion or 50 billion uh, colony forming units per capsule of lactobacillus in someone who's got SIBO due to lactobacillus overgrowth, that, that might kick things up a bit, and especially if it has a prebiotic in it. So generally when people say, do I should I be taking a probiotic? I kind of wait until after we've treated their overgrowth um, or very cautiously introduce small amounts as a trial if they want to. Great. Um, and this question is, is related to diet, but kind of that issue of prebiotics and fiber. Uh, the question is that um, higher, they understand higher fiber foods, such as fruits, vegetables, legumes, and grains can be irritating and promote overgrowth. Um, but if they are cooked and blended, is that then possible to continue eating those higher fiber foods? Fiber is really important for so many reasons. I mean, just going as, as far as preventing colon cancer, it, it has so many important functions. Um, so we don't want a fiber-free diet, but we want less fermentable carbohydrate, and part of that is fiber. So, for instance, uh, as you mentioned, some people, when they start any of these diets, they may find that raw fruits and vegetables are very poorly tolerated. And it, it might be because their digestive tract lining is somewhat irritated, things are out of balance, and putting in more fiber is just irritating and stimulates too much fermentation. So with any of these diets, I like to talk about the high five. It's just a cute name that I gave it. Uh, there's a, there's a, a couple of um, young men who created the SCD Lifestyle website, and they, they introduced this concept. They call it the force four horsemen of the apocalypse. I added one more and call it the high five. And that is no matter what diet you're using for SIBO prevention or treatment, there are five things that may be on that diet, but for you might be problematic and you may have to avoid those initially. So those five things, one would be eggs, Whenever we do food allergy testing, that's probably the most common, absolutely the most common thing that shows high antibodies is eggs. Another uh, food that might be an issue but is on most of these diets is dairy products in general. Now, often if we use 24-hour yogurt or lactose-free dairy products, there's no problem, but some people are sensitive to other things in dairy products, such as the protein. So some people initially, or even long-term, may have to avoid dairy products. A third thing is nuts and seeds. And we know that there are higher FODMAPs nuts, such as pistachios and cashews, that are more likely to be problematic for people with SIBO, but some people react to all kinds of nuts and seeds. So initially, they may need to remove those or minimize those. And then there's raw fruits and vegetables is the fourth thing. So that's why in the introductory type diets for gaps and specific carbohydrate, they talk about peeling vegetables, removing any seeds, 
cooking thoroughly and blending. It's kind of like making baby food, but that can make that can make the vegetable fiber much more tolerable. And same thing with fruits, um, removing seeds if they have them, um, certainly removing peels, and then cooking uh, can can make them much more tolerable. And um, you know even low FODMAP type fruits like blueberries and strawberries might be better if they're just cooked a little bit um, to make kind of a you know in water to make them softer and more digestible. So that's the fourth. The last of the five would be, I always forget the fifth one, uh, last of, of the five would be, did you say nuts and seeds? I did. I said nuts and seeds. I said dairy. I said eggs. I said raw fruits and vegetables. Is and it the last a wheat one, the last one. or gluten? No, gluten is most many of these diets already avoid grain, most grains, and especially gluten grains. Um, I, this is a funny thing with me. I always forget the fifth one, even though I, oh, I put that together. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> honey, fruit or honey? Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Too much fruit or honey. So except for the, the pure Monash University low FODMAPs diet, honey is uh, often considered the safest of the sweeteners besides liquid stevia, which is also quite safe. Um, honey being just a solution of fructose and glucose, it, it doesn't have any disaccharides in it, which are the slightly larger sugars that can uh, be poorly digested due to SIBO and, and lead to more fermentation. So, um, but overdoing the honey uh, or using too much fruit, whether it's cooked or not, uh, for some people will, will either kick up more yeast overgrowth or uh, be problematic for other reasons. So thanks for reminding me of that. I don't know why I always forget that. Um, can you speak on spore-based probiotics, uh, just what you've noticed with them and if you commonly use that with your SIBO patient? This question always comes up, and it's a great question. Um, you know, there are different types of probiotics. So there are food-based probiotic foods, which to me are the top when they're tolerated. And remember that um, fermented foods or probiotic foods, this can especially be an issue for people with histamine intolerance, just because uh, histamine tends to increase when you ferment foods. But going back to probiotics in general, um, they're the, the lactobacillus, the lactic acid-based uh, probiotics, such as lactobacillus, there are, and bifido, there are um, the yeast-based types, such as Saccharomyces boulardii. It's actually a yeast, but it promotes the health of the beneficial bacteria in the gut. And then there's the spore-type probiotics. And these are sometimes called soil-based organisms. Um, spores of bacteria that can live in soil. And we think that, you know, back before we washed our food, um, just found food as hunter gatherers and, and ate it, we would get more of these spores, uh, which could have been a good source of probiotics. And there's quite a bit of research going on with them. I've seen some amazing research uh, presented by some researchers um, that present at conferences I speak at and go to, um, especially with uh, helping to reduce lipopolysaccharide activity um, in the gut, uh, which is really important for controlling inflammation in general. 
uh, I've seen some really nice, really re nice results from studies, but what I find so far, the first 10 years of trying these with patients is that a lot of people don't tolerate them. And one way to get around that, if you want to try a spore type organism is to take just half or a quarter of the dose that's recommended and don't do it every day. So maybe once every other day or every third day, twice a week, if you want to experiment with those. Uh, again, like I said, on paper, when you look at research, it's very, very impressive. And I, I have high hopes for, for that um, in the future. But you really have to start slow and small if you have a tendency to react to things easily. Great. Um, this is a, a particularly uh, timely question. Um, does having SIBO uh, put you at greater risk for contracting coronavirus? Hmm. That is very timely. Uh, I don't know that anybody has studied that. If they have and you know about it, let me know. But um, yeah, I think it's all too new. Now, certainly the bulk of the immune system is in the is in the intestine, the lining of the intestine. And uh, that's a major part of our immune system. And we there is research and there is news that uh, COVID-19 can cause diarrhea and other GI symptoms and perhaps is also transmitted by uh, fecal oral route contaminated uh, fecal oral direct interaction. So um, I suppose that's there's a possibility there and if the immunity is generally down uh, because of SIBO and digestive problems perhaps people would be more prone but I mean, there, are, there are so many factors as blood type seems to make a difference. Um, age makes a difference, pre-existing conditions, um, asthma, tendency toward pneumonia, heart problems, kidney problems. Uh, so I, I don't have any specifics on that, but that may turn out to be the case just by general immunity. Yeah, I agree. Um, so uh, a question about using um, a prokinetic, if you have a tendency towards diarrhea, should you avoid a prokinetic if you have loose stools? Thank you for asking that because most doctors don't understand this either. Um, the important piece to understand is that if the person has a tendency toward diarrhea, if you know hydrogen type SIBO or general tendency toward diarrhea, you still need to improve the migrating motor complex in order to try to prevent recurrence of SIBO. And a prokinetic is a very helpful thing for that besides the meal spacing and you know having 12 hours or more overnight between dinner, finishing dinner and having breakfast, those types of things. But um, you would think, it's logical, you would think that if someone has diarrhea, there's no way you wanna improve motility. Well, you don't wanna increase motility in the colon, in the large intestine, because that's what creates a bowel movement you do want to maximize or optimize motility in the stomach and the small intestine, which is where the migrating motor complex works. Because slowing down of that upper GI motility is often behind most of the mechanisms that lead to bacterial overgrowth. So, so you wanna use a prokinetic, we find, um, to, to optimize prevention 
whether the person tends towards diarrhea, constipation, or um, alternation between the two. The difference would be we tend to use prokinetics that focus on the upper GI tract when the person has a tendency toward diarrhea. We don't want to stimulate colon. Um, colonic movements that lead to a bowel movement are called mass movements. And those are triggered by eating food or drinking liquid, anything that distends the stomach. It's called the gastrocolic reflux. Oh, sorry, gastrocolic reflex. It's a nerve reflex that when gastrocolic, gastro being stomach, when the stomach is distended, the filled with food or liquid, that stimulates nerves that trigger mass movements in the large intestine. It makes sense. If you're going to put more food into the beginning of the digestive tract, it makes sense to get rid of what's in the rectum or the left side of the colon and, you know, make room for more to move down. So the gastrocolic reflex, together with the orthocolic reflex, which is when you move around as you wake up in the morning, that tends to, the two of them tend to stimulate a bowel movement. That's why most people tend to have bowel movements in the morning if they're not going to have more later in the day. And um, so it, it just gives you the idea that eating food is a major stimulus for a bowel movement. So if a person wants to stimulate small intestine motility, that doesn't produce a bowel movement, but it's the migrating motor complex. It, it's what moves food out of the stomach into the small intestine and through the small intestine. The migrating motor complex, the small intestine activity, muscular activity is stimulated by not eating, by fasting. And that's why meal spacing is important because four to five hours after a meal, if you have normal gastric emptying time, the food in the stomach will be 90% gone and moved into the small intestine. And it's that empty stomach or near empty stomach that triggers the migrating motor complex to start through a hormone called motilin, excuse me, motilin. And so activity, muscular activity in the small intestine is totally different in terms of what stimulates it than the large intestine. So again, we're going to focus on for patients that tend to have diarrhea, we're gonna focus on prokinetics that, that are aimed at the upper digestive tract. So things like iberogastic might be a good choice, although it does have some activity on the serotonin receptors for large intestine as well, but the dosage can be varied. Ginger is an excellent choice. Motility activator is an excellent choice for the upper GI tract. Um, low-dose erythromycin is excellent. It's very focused on motilin agonist activity, which is all stimulating migrating motor complex and, and stomach emptying, not the colon. And if someone has constipation, then we, then we might choose some of these that have more activity in the large intestine, such as procalipride, um, and some of the ones that I didn't mention today um, that also work on serotonin receptors. Great. Um, so do you have a, a first line treatment, something that you consider first line treatment for SIBO? Uh, as in, do you choose uh, herbal remedies versus uh, prescription remedies versus elemental diet? Is there um, a preference that you have in choosing one over the other? Um, yeah. Well, I have personal preferences just because I think herbs are terrific and amazing and complex and beautiful, but it really depends on the person. So. If I have, if I'm consulting with someone or have a patient who 
is extremely sensitive. They say, oh, you know, I, I took turmeric and it, it made me really sick. I can't take that stuff. Well, turmeric is, is like the most benign, positive, beneficial, safe thing for almost everybody. When, when I have people that just can't take herbs, they, they react to lots of medicines, they have lots of reactions, they probably have poor uh, what we call hepatic detoxification. Their, their liver detoxification systems are not working as well as they should. Um, their intestinal detoxification systems aren't working as well as they should. So sometimes people in that situation do much better with a single compound, such as an, an antibiotic, a, pers a synthetic antibiotic, because it's really just a single molecule. Uh, it's a single compound, as opposed to something like an herbal that you take any one herb, it's going to have hundreds, if not thousands of different components. And they're all doing different things. So if you take that person who's very sensitive and you just try to kill a certain percentage of their normal small intestine flora because it's overgrown, you're doing not exactly just one thing, but closer to one thing, focusing on decreasing that bacteria or archaea. But if you give an herb, you might be affecting improved blood sugar, improving um, healing of the gut lining, uh, you have antioxidant activity, you have um, activity that will upregulate their detoxification pathways, you have things that are killing fungus and yeast, you have things that are killing bacteria, you have things that are killing viruses, it goes on and on and on. Herbs are, are very complex and they're wonderful, but they're very complex. And so Sometimes herbs do more than someone can handle. And so we might go with a synthetic product for them. Some people choose prescription antibiotics because their insurance covers it. And they end up with, I've had patients with a zero copay for prescription, whereas their insurance is not gonna cover any of the, the herbal treatment. And so it's just cheaper for them and more affordable. Uh, with the elemental diet, as I said, elemental diet is especially useful for people who don't have eating disorders, who feel like they can, they're up to the challenge of just a liquid diet for two to three weeks at a time, um, and who um, have very high levels of gases, especially hydrogen. We've seen hydrogen levels decrease by up to 150 parts per million in two to three weeks. You can't do that with really hardly anything else. So each of these has their special areas that they might be most appropriate for. And it just depends on the person's situation. Right, right. Um, can you speak on using a uh, partially hydrolyzed uh, guar gum and uh, the probiotic lactobacillus ruteri in the treatment of SIBO? Yeah, so thanks for asking that. Uh, partially hydrolyzed guar gum has been studied together with, given with rifaximin as a treatment for hydrogen SIBO. And it used to be that the dosage for rifaximin for treating hydrogen SIBO was 550 milligrams twice a day for 10 days. So it was a 10-day treatment with two pills per day. That was the standard. And a study was done back... Uh, early 2000s, where they thought maybe if we added some of this fiber that's partially uh, hydrolyzed 
so that it's not as irritating, we would be able to kind of supercharge that rifaximin treatment. And it turns out it did increase the, the effectiveness. But then several years later, the standard dosage for treating SIBO with rifaximin was changed. A study found that using one tablet three times a day for 14 days made it much more effective. And it actually made it the same effectiveness as taking rifaximin at the lower dose with the partially hydrolyzed guar gum. So Dr. Seebecker and I have tried that with some patients, not recently, but uh, back before the, the new dosage of rifaximin was de devised. And we found that it caused, a lot of people would have tremendous bloating from the partially hydrolyzed guar gum. It's five grams a day of that. Uh, and so we kind of let it drop off since the new uh, dosage of rifaximin was just as effective. So that's my experience with that. The ruteri, uh, lactobacillus ruteri, my understanding is that's especially useful for methane SIBO. And we occasionally try that when other things have failed, but I haven't needed to use it very often. So I don't have a lot of experience with it. Um, can you speak on uh, atrantil? Uh, the question is, does it actually uh, decrease archaea or is it just symptomatic relief? for bloating and constipation. Yeah. So Autrantil is a combination of three herbs that are aimed at methane reduction. There's a horse chestnut, there's a pau de arco, and there's peppermint. And it makes a lot of sense. This is based on research, I believe, research uh, with cows. Cows make a lot of methane from grass, and uh, there's been quite a bit of research on reducing the methane so that we don't get as much greenhouse gas. And Dr. Brown down in uh, Texas uh, put these three herbs together as a formula, and I would say, if I were to estimate, I would say about 35 to 40 percent of people with high methane levels that, that try it, get pretty significant benefit from it, either with bloating or constipation. Uh, you know, theoretically it's designed to, first of all, um, slightly slow down motility in, in the upper gut in order to kind of trap the methanogens um, there and then, and then work on them. I think that's a transient effect. It, it relaxes spasm, if nothing else. And then uh, it reduces the ability of the methane producing organisms, reduces their ability to convert hydrogen to methane. So that can lower the, the methane level. And then um, it also has some direct activity on killing and reducing the numbers of methanogens. And I would say that I think of it as more of a uh, symptom reliever rather than a true full treatment uh, that you could take for a period of time and then not need it anymore and not have the methane problems anymore. So that's just been my experience that it, it can be really useful to lower levels of, of methane production, especially for people that may have tried other things to to try to reduce methanogens and it just either wasn't enough or even though it did reduce it, they still have symptoms. I think of it as analogous to what Dr. Pimentel is trying to do to come up with a prescription medicine that will stay in the gut, not be absorbed into the blood, and will reduce or stop the ability of the methanogens from converting hydrogen to methane. 
And that'll be a great symptomatic treatment if it's safe and effective. It makes a lot of sense. So I think atrantil is kind of what, what we have herbally at this point that works that way. Uh, a few a few questions about breath testing. Um, why do you why are you interested in the three hour lactulose breath test if that last hour of the large intestine uh, is not as important in the diagnosis of SIBO? Um, and have you observed any any reactions that patients have to the lactulose itself? Certainly some people have reactions to lactulose since it's an unabsorbable sugar. Interesting thing, I can't say this is always the case, but some people, the first time they'll do a lactulose breath test, the lactulose will really bother them. And that would make sense if they have significant overgrowth and that lactulose gets converted more efficiently into gas by the bacterium. Um, and we always kind of keep a little log of symptoms that have them keep a little log of symptoms that develop during the test. And then they'll tell me, hey, you know, uh, I just did another follow-up after treatment. I did another breath test and it didn't bother me at all like it did the first time. I'll bet that test is going to look a lot better when the results are back. So I've seen that, that tendency uh, to once once they're doing better to react to it less and that makes total sense um what was the other part of the question <laughs> sorry i threw two questions at you in, at once um the other question is why are you interested in a three-hour lactulose breath test rather than a two-hour lactulose breath test yeah so there was one lab there is a lab that they're a good lab but they uh, they refused to do more than a two-hour test until about two or three years ago. I kept asking them to, and I guess others did as well, and they eventually did. The, the advantage of a three-hour test is that, number one, you get a better idea about how long it takes for the lactulose to go through the digestive tract, so you get some idea about transit time. Um, in that last three specimens, we tend not to look at what the hydrogen levels are doing, except we expect the hydrogen to shoot up. Now, a perfect test, some doctors think, is a test that has what we call a second peak. It has a peak that's high in the small intestine, it goes back down, and then when it on those last three specimens in the large intestine, at some point it shoots back up again, often higher than it ever was before. That first peak shows us there's SIBO in the small bowel, and the second peak shows us that there's adequate and prolific amounts of bacteria, especially hydrogen producers, in the large intestine. We like to see that, and we don't want low low numbers of hydrogen producers in the large intestine they belong there in in large numbers and they're very important remember there's no bad bacteria in SIBO by definition it's all overgrowth of normal what we used to call friendly flora and it's just overgrowth so that's one thing that we can see with a third hour is that the large intestine flora are intact. The other thing it allows us to do is until we have a reliable test that's commercially available to test also for hydrogen sulfide, we won't really be able to diagnose it with a two hour test. In order to really know that, well, it, you don't know for sure, but in order to make a educated guess that hydrogen sulfide is the issue, we expect to not see any rise of hydrogen in the colon. And you won't see that methane go up either because the hydrogen sulfide producing organisms like desulfovibrio um, will take the hydrogen and very effectively convert 
almost all of it to hydrogen sulfide. So you never see the hydrogen go up and you never see the methane go up. And you really can't do that. You can't make that determination if you only have a two hour test because then you don't see that it's just flat and no rise as well in the large intestine. And the hydrogen sulfide producers are throughout the whole, the whole small and large intestine. And if they're overgrown, it's gonna look flat. I think we have time for one more question and then we'll have to wrap up. Um, so this question is about the difference between using a semi-elemental diet versus a fully elemental diet. So a semi-elemental diet being something like Absorb Plus and the fully elemental diet being something like the physician's elemental diet. Yeah, there's no reason why a semi-elemental diet might not work. It certainly works quite well in childhood Crohn's disease, just as a fully elemental diet can work in childhood Crohn's disease. So I, you know, I think it's it's reasonable. Um, Semi-elemental diet means that not all of the proteins are fully digested. They might require some digestion. And the thing is that if the proteins are the only thing that are semi-elemental and the carbohydrates are more elemental, that seems like a, a good option. It could work. It's not. I don't know that anyone has a, a, a good study on that, although I think Dr. Uh, Ruscio is working on that, if he hasn't already. Um, but, you know, they don't, they don't generally, they don't really convert protein. If they do, that's news to me. They convert fermentable carbohydrates. Um, protein isn't likely to be fermentable by bacteria. So uh, that being the case, if a semi-elemental diet has some larger protein fragments in it rather than pure amino acids, uh, it could work just as well. So I just don't, I'm not aware of a study yet that proves that, but it makes total sense to me that it could work. And it'll probably be much less bitter, taste much better, and be uh, cheaper. So I'm all open to that possibility. Fantastic. Well, um, uh, thank you all for your for your questions. Um, those were really uh, great, great questions. And um, uh, sorry we couldn't get to everyone. And um, I hope that uh, you have benefited from the presentation and learned and uh, learned some new things. And, and Dr. Sandberg Lewis um, has some more information here about the uh, the course. It's uh, coming up that he's offering that can dive more deeply into each of these uh, topics. Yeah, so this is a, a URL. If you're if you're interested in looking into that, you can click on it, and it will take you to the registration page for that. And um, that will start. We're we're just going to stick with Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. And that will start three weeks from now on May 21st, Thursday, May 21st at 10 a.m. And it'll be six uh, Thursdays in a row. And uh, included in that as well is a half hour individual Zoom or phone session with me where you can ask uh, questions about your your personal situation and I can uh, consult with you about what you can what you can do with your local physician to uh, to deal with that situation so um, that's an option and this last picture I hope we all live happily ever after um, and I wish you a great day and uh, much success with your health and everything in general. Thanks again. 
Thanks, everyone. And just a reminder, the session is being recorded and I'll send this out to all of you so you can have access to the recording and, and get to review all of this information uh, all over again. Thank you again for joining us today.